Hello guys, back with another video and today's video is about Frankie Lyman. Frankie Lyman was the lead singer of the teenagers in the 50s. Frankie Lyman inspired Ronnie Spector to have a career in the music industry in the 50s. Frankie has inspired Diana Ross, Michael Jackson, the Beach Boys, Billy Joel just to name a few. At the age of 13, Frankie had it all fame, money and women. The Frankie Lyman story should be a cautionary tale to young celebrities in Hollywood today. Disclaimer. I am not sure what is true or false in this video. I just find the information about a celebrity and make videos. This is not a biography channel, and it is just for entertainment purposes only. Please do not take any information from this video as factual. Thanks. Lyman was born in Washington Heights, New York City on September 30, 1942, to Jeanette and Howard Lyman. Howard was a truck driver and Jeanette was a maid. Frankie grew up with five siblings living in the same apartment complex. Frankie's parents had to work extra hard to survive. Frankie said in an Ebony interview that kids his age were playing stickball and marbles, I was working in the corner grocery store carrying orders to help pay the rent. Frankie started working at the grocery store at 10 years old, helping shoppers to carry their groceries home. Some of them were local prostitutes who placed their visiting cards in shop windows. They soon realized that this was a streetwise kid and so Frankie was finding clients for them, especially white men who were looking for black girls. In 1967, he told Ebony magazine, sometimes they'd pay me off with something extra. I learned everything there was to know about women before I was 12 years old. Frankie spent some of his earnings on drugs, only marijuana at this stage but of course a 12-year-old shouldn't be smoking grass. He liked listening to the radio and the way that Dinah Washington, Ruth Brown and little Jimmy Scott phrased and sang their songs was soaking into his skin. Singing was very much in his blood because both of his parents were in a gospel group called, The Harlemaries. Frankie and his brothers also sang in a group called, The Harlemaries Jr. At Stitt Junior High, Frankie played bongos with his brother Howie on congas in a mambo band. He made his TV debut performing with Jimmy Marchant and Sherman Garns as the premieres on a talent show, Spotlight on Harlem. With the addition of two Puerto Ricans, Herman Santiago and Joe Negroni, the premieres became multiracial with Lyman, the youngest by two years, restricted to harmonies and occasional lead. He sang lead on their own song, I Want You To Be My Girl. Richie Barrett lived in an apartment over the bodega and the premieres auditioned by singing underneath his window. He was amused by Herman singing R&B with a Spanish accent and he thought they had potential. High Weiss at Old Town wasn't interested, he was overrun with groups and couldn't take any more. Barrett tried to impress Bobby Robinson at Red Robin, but Robinson was stuck at the New Jersey Turnpike and didn't arrive, so he took them to George Goldner instead. They were singing current successes like You Painted Pictures and Goodnight, Sweetheart sung by the Spaniels, Why Don't You Write Me sung by the Jackson, That's What You're Doing to Me sung by Dominoes and Capris. George Goldner told them he needed something original. He liked I Want You to Be My Baby and Please Be Mine and wanted more. Barrett was to supervise them, and they would record in a couple of months if all went well. Goldner placed them with his new G label, which had been named after his crossover hit, G by the Crows or possibly after himself. Goldner recorded Latin music and so he might have gone with Herman's lead vocals, but he realized that Frankie was sensational, and he could see the potential of Why Do Fools Fall in Love. They had a new name, the Coupe de Villes, and they were backed by Jimmy Wright's band and, as on the Wu Wu Train, Wright enhanced the record with his saxophone. When Goldner was telling the singers not to mess up the takes, Wright said, why don't you leave those teenagers alone, and so the Coupe de Villes were renamed the Teenagers. Why Do Fools Fall in Love was released in December 1955. The single credited to the teenagers featuring Frankie Lyman, but within a few months, Lyman had top billing. So who wrote the song? Judging by court evidence some 30 years later, the credit should have gone to Jimmy Merchant and Herman Santiago. George Goldner, sensing a hit, wanted a piece of the action and for some unknown reason, he dropped Merchant and added Lyman, thus making the credit on the original pressing of the single, Lyman Santiago Goldner. However, when he registered the song's copyright with the Library of Congress, he simply gave the names Lyman and Goldner. If he had been a complete thief instead of a 50% one, it is possible that a court order could have removed Goldner's credit and put the song into public domain where nobody would have benefited. 
When the group went to Hollywood for a live coast-to-coast -coast appearance on Frankie Lane's TV show, Lane asked Frankie about writing Why Do Fools Fall in Love, but I think this is showbiz banter rather than a claim for authorship. Lyman tells Lane that the song was easy to write as he had been falling in love since he was five, clearly a scripted joke. The first rock and roll show proper for Frankie Lyman and the teenagers was at the Riviera Theater, Detroit with the Jewels on February 20, 1956. They did okay but lacked stagecraft and moved on to the Hartford State Theater to appear with Bo Diddley, Fats Domino, and the Cadillacs in front of 4,000 fans. Their Earl Wade of the Cadillacs recommended Charlie Atkins, a vaudeville performer who had helped the Cadillacs. Charlie saw how agile they were and that both Herman and Frankie could do the splits. He built up a highly watchable act with interchange between the members but concentrating on Frankie. The fact that Sherman was 6 foot 4 and Frankie 4 foot 10 worked to their advantage. On March 30, 1956, Frankie Lyman and the teenagers started a 10-day run with the Platters, the Cleft Ones and saxophonist Sam the Man Taylor for Alan Freed at the Brooklyn Paramount. The Platters had the number one with The Great Pretender and the teenagers were in the top 10 so the show was bound to do well. The fashion moment belongs to the Valentines who wore white suits with red hearts and had crazy, colored shoes. The acts performed six shows a day in between the showing of an Abbott and Costello movie and even though ticket prices were around $2, the gross for the 10 days was $200,000. Expecting a riot, the police were patrolling the concert as though they were at Alcatraz. Freed had turned down a $30,000 flat fee for hosting a rival package at another New York theater, so you can sense how profitable this was. Relatively little of that take got to the performers, especially the teenagers. A cash box cover picture showed Goldner and Joe Kolsky with the teenagers. Kolsky was the co-director of G with Goldner, and he was a gangster and a front man for the infamous Morris Levy. Morris had got half control of Goldner's labels as he was covering his gambling debts. Frankie Lyman was to say, they bought me whatever I wanted. What would any kid of 13 want? I didn't want bank accounts. They'd pat me on the head and tell me how great I was. Each of the teenagers was given $10 a week, which was later increased to $25. If anyone asked, Goldner would say that their earnings were going into a trust fund which would be available when they were 21. The Brooklyn Paramount is where things started to go wrong. Already they were being swindled out of their royalties but here they were having to stay in a theater day after day from 10 in the morning till 10 at night and the clue was in their name, the teenagers. Frankie was 13, Herman, Sherman and Joe were 15, and Jimmy was 16. When it came to their education, Morris Levy didn't care at all. He didn't even employ qualified teachers. He told girls from his nightclubs to go to the Paramount. They may well have taught him a few things, but I doubt if they were in the syllabus. The group was to enroll with the School for Young Professionals in New York City. They would attend if they were in the area but otherwise, they would study by correspondence. The black magazine, Hugh, ran a feature on Frankie in which he said he was concentrating on schoolwork. More important to Levy than schoolwork was having a strong follow-up. I want you to be my girl. Was written by Herman Santiago but suffered from being too similar to their debut. The song was in existence before the teenagers met Goldner and probably Barrett and yet the songwriting credit is Goldner and Barrett. On April 20, 1956, Frankie Lyman and the teenagers were an added attraction to a nationwide touring party, the biggest rock and roll show of 1956, which ran through until early June and featured Bill Haley, The Platters, Laverne Baker, Bo Diddley and several others. This was a grueling tour, traveling long distances by coach and occasionally by plane. The teenagers witnessed the segregation of audiences in the South and experienced racial tension. They saw that the Drifters and the Flamingos had guns close to hand, the Colts too but I suppose the clue was in their name. There was a demonstration in Birmingham, Alabama from those who objected to a show featuring both black and white performers. Bill Haley and his Comets had star treatment, regularly staying in Hilton and Sheridan hotels, while the others were in fleabag digs or slept on the bus. Sometimes the white performers would eat in a restaurant and food would be brought out to the black artists. Those troubles aside, Frankie was rather liking the nightclub hostesses who were giving him their time. Although they were around 30, he had relationships with a couple of them and he would tell reporters that they were his mother. He was almost caught out when a reporter saw him with his mother in New York and a different mother in Chicago, 
but the reporter didn't put two and two together. Zola Taylor of the Platters, who was known as The Dish, was a sophisticated 18-year-old. She was attracted to the young Frankie who was 14 years old. They had an on-and-off relationship. She had a sexual relationship with him for some years. You might think that no woman would ever admit to this and thereby incriminate herself, but after his death, she was one of three claimants for his future royalties, and she staked her claim by revealing their sexual history. In June, Frankie Lyman and the teenagers found themselves with Laverne Baker, the Johnny Burnett trio and Lonnie Donegan. The group's fourth single, The ABCs of Love, had originally been scheduled as the follow-up to I Want You to Be My Girl. It was a fun song but a nonsense one, attributed to George Goldner and Richie Barrett. It only reached number 43 but that was still good for a black group on a minor label and the teenagers had had four top 50 hits within a year. The B-side, a plaintive ballad share boasted a terrific performance from Frankie, but the teenagers were doing too much, this would have worked better as a solo recording. Throughout July 1956, Frankie Lyman and the teenagers were appearing on the top record tour with Carl Perkins and Chuck Berry, and they were back on the road in September in the biggest show of 56 with Bill Haley and the Platters, which ran through until November. They had to contend with a snowstorm in Denver, but no doubt Zola kept Frankie warm. The group had filmed their contribution to rock. 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 In a day, but the whole film can't have taken much longer. The teenagers perform Baby Baby and I'm Not a Juvenile Delinquent very professionally. At the end of Delinquent, Lyman clasps his hands in prayer and looks heavenward, a glorious moment. I'm Not a Juvenile Delinquent had been given to the teenagers by Bobby Spencer of the Cadillacs, but George Goldner took the credit. It was a response to critics who said that rock and roll was about delinquency so maybe Frankie Lyman was the wrong person to deliver this message, although his performance was tremendous. I loved Baby, Baby because it is a cheerful song with a teasing stop-slash-start rhythm. Frankie shouts stop, for no apparent reason between the verses, and the song ends with him going, that's all, bye-bye. That ending is cribbed from Little Richard's Every Hour, 1951. The film's producer Milton Sabotsky was listed as the composer, alongside Glenn T. Moore, who wrote for Bing Crosby. Prior to the film's release, I'm Not a Juvenile Delinquent was chosen as the group's next 45. Strangely, it did not chart in America. At the start of 1957, G issued the extended play, Go Rocking and Go Romantic, although they only contained two new cuts. These were coupled for the group's next single, Teenage Love and Paper Castles, the last single on which Frankie would work with the teenagers. In February 1957 the film Don't Knock the Rock was shown at the Times Square Paramount with a live show from the teenagers and the platters, though neither act was in the film. After two weeks, the teenagers went to the annual carnival in Panama and performed for a week. A show in Cologne attracted 13,000 and a newspaper report said they were paid $7,500 for the week. When things did go wrong, their manager Morris Levy put the blame on them, according to Levy, they started fighting amongst themselves and they wanted everything split equally. They wanted to do solo numbers and none of them had the talent for it. The other teenagers meant very little to me. There was nothing personal in what I did there. Anyone with a half a brain would pick Frankie Lyman. During 1956, there had been no American rock and roll acts performing in the UK. The only artist to come over was Pat Boone. That changed in 1957 with a succession of spring tours, Bill Haley and his Comets for the Grades, Mitchell Torok for Bernard Delfont, The Platters for Moss Empires, and Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers for Arthur Howes. Haley mostly played one-nighters at Odeon Cinemas, but the others starred on variety bills in a mixture of one-nighters and weekly residencies. They were mostly in the provinces. Frankie Lyman and the teenagers had two weeks at the London Palladium which is a colossal achievement for a group who were unknown 15 months earlier and whose lead singer was only 14. They were told that they would have to record their performance on ITV's Sunday night at the London Palladium as otherwise they would be working for 13 consecutive days. That was only a part of the story as the group was booked continuously for almost three months. The young boys were 3,000 miles from home without their parents. Their weeks in variety were largely with Johnny Duncan and his bluegrass boys and specialist acts, Vera Cody and her horse Goldie, a one-man band, jugglers, dancers, and acrobats. Goldie would do circus tricks and speak to the audience, although that was really a bloke offstage with a microphone. 
The one-nighters were music-based with the Chaz McDevitt Skiffle Group, Terry Lightfoot's Jasmine and Billy Anthony. The posters caused tensions within the group as they read The Teenagers with Wonder Boy Frankie Lyman. With tour manager Jack Lewin, who worked for Morris Levy, and conductor Rudy Trailer, the group arrived in London for rehearsals and the press welcomed their American visitors. Things almost went disastrously wrong on that first night. Jimmy and Herman picked up some girls and brought them to the hotel, causing the manager to phone the police. Frankie had his personal tutor with him, Miss Lulu Carter, not a typical name for a schoolmistress, she worked for one of Morris Levy's nightclubs. Chaz McDevitt stated that he never saw any of them studying. He recalls, I went to Frankie's room to get some autographs and he was sitting on a chair with a bird on his knee and a bottle in his hand. The more popularity that Frankie got, the more other famous people like composer Eddie Yamu and other newspaper publications started to celebrate Frankie's voice. Nori Perimer at Electric and Musical Industries wanted to record Frankie's singing standards but without the teenagers. The teenagers soon realized that they had been cut out of the sessions and threatened to strike, so that Frankie would have to perform solo. They accepted the position after being told that backing vocals would be added in America. When they returned to America, Frankie told one reporter, the headline notices I received in Britain caused other members of the group to become jealous. Since our return, we have hardly spoken. Their new single, recorded in January, with the Panama Francis band was creating problems. Out in the Cold Again featured Frankie Lyman and a very subdued teenagers but despite the billing miracle in the rain only featured Lyman on his own. The other teenagers felt they were being sidelined. While Frankie Lyman was considering a new market, his brother Lewis was stepping into his old territory. The brothers didn't get along, but they were very young. When fans had come to the family's tenement to see Frankie, Lewis would pretend he was him. Maybe it was just as well. Ronnie Spector met the real Frankie and said, he was very disappointing. He was very full of himself and egotistical like a big star. I thought he would be innocent like his records. Also, around this time, Goody Goody was released. Goody Goody was a UK top 30 hit and even though he performed it on American Bandstand, the US public ignored both the single and album, a shame because there were good performances and his scat singing on Somebody Love Me was tremendous. The outtakes from the sessions which have now been issued are equally good. Opening in September 1957 and filmed earlier, Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers appeared in another Alan Freed film, Mr. Rock and Roll, the time along with Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Brooke Benton, and Clyde McFadder. The publicity proclaimed, young people, show your adults how terrific your music is. Take them to see this picture that explains all about the new exciting rhythm. They'll love it as much as you do. Frankie Lyman and the teenagers performed Fortunate Fellow and Love Put Me Out of My Head, but their time had gone and no single was released. In December 1957, Frankie appeared solo on The Ed Sullivan Show, performing Goody Goody and It's Christmas Once Again. Lyman had been transferred to the newly founded Roulette label, formed by George Goldner and Alan Freed. Frankie recorded two good, up-tempo rockers, Portable On My Shoulder and Thumb Thumb, but they didn't sell. As the album of standards hadn't sold, Goldner wanted him back rocking and so he made Rocking with Frankie Lyman, which was titled Rock and Roll in the States. Issued in the summer of 1958, this comprised 12 chart favorites including Jailhouse Rock, Short Fat Fanny and Diana, which Paul Anka had offered to Frankie and to Little Anthony before he cut it himself. One track, Little Bitty Pretty One, made number 58 as a single and he appeared on the nationwide show, Alan Freed's Big Beat. His performance was fine but at the end he joined the other acts and the studio audience to groove to Marv Johnson, I'm Coming Home. It was innocuous enough, but Frankie danced with a white girl. The advertisers down south were furious and withdrew their support, causing the show to be cancelled. Frankie was now 16 and his voice had changed as shown by the singles, The Novelty Up Jumped a Rabbit and The Rocking Melinda. They were humdrum songs, and the performances were not instantly recognizable as Lyman. Frankie was still dating older girls and one of them introduced him to heroin. Meanwhile, the teenagers were recording with a new lead singer, Billy Lebrano. Flip Flop was a flop, but Lebrano had the wrong voice, sounding more like Frankie Avalon. Coming from Jimmy Castor and the Juniors, Kenny Bobo joined them for a single early in 1960, and then came Johnny Houston, who sounded more like Jackie Wilson. 
A deal with Columbia yielded a very good A-side, The Draw, a western song written and produced by Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller, featuring Sherman Garns as the sheriff, but the teenagers were dropped shortly afterwards. They would never be considered chart potential again, although they performed on oldies shows. In 1959 Frankie Lyman met Elizabeth Waters, who had done time for theft. They got on well and he did try to kick his drug addiction with the help of his road manager Bob Redcross, who had experienced similar problems with Charlie Parker. His mother was having treatment for cancer although the illness was kept from her and when she died in 1960, she was only 39. This put Lyman back on drugs. The combination of heroin and alcohol made it impossible for Lyman to maintain his career and he was wrecking his voice. Things brightened up when they had a baby, Francine but she died after two days. They married illegally in 1964 as Elizabeth was not divorced and they moved to Philadelphia with Elizabeth becoming a prostitute to earn money for Frankie's drugs. Frank Allen of the Searchers was in for a shock. He said, on my first visit to America with the Searchers in September 1964, we played 42 shows at the Fox Theater in Brooklyn over seven days. I ended one night by calling in at Joey D's Starlight Club in Manhattan. Mike Pender and myself went with Estelle Bennett and Nedra Talley of the Ronettes and Larry Curzon, an executive from the William Morris Agency. The live act on stage, a girl trio called the Ragdolls, had finished their spot and as we sat chatting, Nedra and Estelle got up to speak to a young man who had just come in. I was introduced to Frankie Lyman. He was into his 20s and had aged a lot. The atmosphere was not casual, and he seemed unsettled and worried. I returned to our table and when the girls came back, they explained that he was on the scrounge for money and it was to get drugs. That shocked me as I knew nothing of his addictions. I was thrilled to have shaken his hand, but this was so sad. There were occasional records, but his work had the same desperate ring as his personal life, although the answer to who put the bump, I put the bump, was surprisingly good, and true. Sessions for 20th Century Fox in Columbia came to naught. Frankie was relying on nostalgia to keep his flagging career alive, and he would mime his early singles as he couldn't perform them acceptably. Frankie should have been receiving songwriting royalties for Why Do Fools Fall In Love from Morris Levy, especially as it had been recorded by the Beach Boys. By 1965 George Goldner had lost the rights to his labels through his gambling debts being made good by Morris Levy. Levy also gave Lyman $1,500 for the rights to his half-share of Why Do Fools Fall In Love, but as the agreement had been drawn up by Levy's lawyer, it was later argued that it was null and void as he was acting for both sides. As part of the deal, Goldner told the copyright office that Levy had written the song with Lyman, so Levy had complete control of the song and its publishing. In 1967, it was a US hit for the happenings, and Lyman had been bought out. With his $1,500, Lyman left Elizabeth and moved to Los Angeles where he was reunited with Zola Taylor from the Platters. She was to claim that they married in Tijuana in 1965, but there was no documentary evidence of this. His addiction continued with heroin costing him $75 a day. In December 1965 Zola was going with the Platters to Japan for three months. In an unbelievably foolish move, she left Frankie in charge of her house and gave him the money to pay the bills and the mortgage. When she returned, the money had gone, Frankie had gone, and the bills were unpaid. Frankie met up with another singer with the same problems, Dion. Dion told The Guardian in 2006, it was the bleakest, darkest and most emotional period of my life. It was hell on earth, and I could see that I was at death's door. I used to get high with Frankie Lyman. We used to share needles. It was pretty grim. At one stage, Frankie was even begging on the streets. Frankie was interested in playing the drums and he stole a set from a recording studio, but he ended up selling them to pay for his habit. He was arrested and his pitiful plight was outlined in court. The court came to a remarkable decision. Frankie would undergo rehabilitation and then join the army instead of jail. He was stationed at Fort Gordon in Georgia. Coming out of rehab in July 1966, Frankie said, I'm not ashamed to let people know I took the cure. Maybe my story will stop someone from going wrong. Thinking that his recovery would aid recruitment, the army agreed to a feature, comeback of an ex-star for the black magazine, Ebony. He explained how fit he was, how much he enjoyed the army and that when he returned to performing, he would be much improved because of all the traumas he had faced, 
this realization will add depth to my capacity as an artist. Frankie befriended a schoolteacher Amira Eagle whom he met at a benefit concert. They wanted to get married on June 30, 1967, but Frankie wasn't allowed to leave the base. He went AWOL for three days and then returned to Fort Gordon to face the discipline. There were further disciplinary issues, and he came out of the Army on December 22, 1967, said to be unable to adjust to Army life. He planned to settle down with Amira in Augusta, Georgia. In January 1968 he was back in the studio in New York and cut Sea Breeze and I'm Sorry with a view to a roulette release, an indication that Levy still had some hold on him. I'm Sorry is a good, Motown-style record that later became popular on the northern soul scene. In Seabreeze, he is singing about a magical place, but is it about finding paradise and drugs or going to heaven? It's a strong plaintive ballad and the echo on Lyman's voice makes him sound like Paul Anka. A tribute song, Harlem Roulette by the Mountain Goats, released in 2012, mentions this track. By February 1968 his voice was fine, and he knew what he wanted to do with it. He had befriended the producer Sam Bray, and he was going to make a new album, Sinatra is where it's at and I'd rather do a fine ballad or a swinging jazz tune. I've grown up a lot. I was merely a pawn in a big chess game. Frankie flew from Georgia to New York for a recording session the following afternoon. On February 27, 1968, he spent the night at his grandmother's house while she was visiting a relative. It would appear that he took some heroin to celebrate his comeback and he was found dead in the bathroom the following day. He is buried in St. Raymond's Cemetery in the Bronx. The Frankie Lyman story is really sad and should be a cautionary tale to young starlets in the entertainment industry. If you look at Lindsay Lohan, Amanda Bynes, Michael Jackson, Macaulay Culkin and Aaron Carter, they all have similar stories to Frankie Lyman. If Frankie had lived longer and sorted himself out, he could have written about the horrors of his life and campaigned for legislation to ensure that nothing like this could happen to a child star again. All right guys. This is the end of the video. If you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up. If you have not subscribed, please hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell for new videos. Please leave a comment down below because I want to hear your thoughts. Also share this video to other social media platforms. Bye.